how to legally do subject to deals. In today's video, I'm gonna walk you through is doing subject to deals legal? The second one to do is I'm gonna show you the pitfalls, the potential pitfalls of doing a subject to deal. And then at the end review, how do taxes work on any subject to deals that you do? Guys, before we get into it, do me a favor, make sure you smash that like button, you hit that subscribe button to continue to receive the best up-to-date videos on wholesaling today. So you guys have heard it, subject twos. I've been in this deal detail on how to find them, how to get them. So let's talk about some of the legalities of it. Probably the biggest question I get about subject two is, Rick, is this a legal strategy? The definitive answer is yes, 100%. It is legal. There is no law on the books in the United States that legally prevents you from doing a subject two deal. Remember, a subject two deal is simply when you take over someone's existing mortgage and you make the payment on it, okay? So the act of a subject two deal in itself, there is no laws against it. But let's further clarify on how this works. So on your state approved contracts, meaning the contract that realtors and lawyers have approved in most of the states in the United States, there's a line on there when you do a purchase and sales agreement for existing mortgage transfer or subject to transfer. And what that means is they've already built it into the contracts. Now, not only is it built on your purchase and sales agreements, if you go to any HUD one statement, there is a line item number on there for the transfer of existing loans or subject to. Same thing. It means the same thing. So it's perfectly legal in the federal government's eyes when they put it on a HUD one statement and clarify it and give you the rules for it. It's also on your state approved real estate contract. So why do people think that subjects twos are like illegal? Well, let me get into it. You've got to understand that a subject to is completely voluntary from both parties. So a seller has to be 100% compliant to do it because typically it is the only strategy that's going to make sense for them without them paying a ton of money or potentially getting the property foreclosed on them. So let's talk about some of the pitfalls that you might encounter doing a subject to. And here's the really cool thing is there's not a lot. The biggest fear mongering you're going to find on subject to is what we call the due on sale clause. Okay. And remember the due on sale clause is just a clause that's put within mortgage documents that says in the event that this property gets sold, deeded, or transferred, the mortgage needs to be paid in full. Now keep in mind back in the early eighties, you could do assumable mortgages all day long. There's very few that exist anymore. So the due on sale clause protects the bank. If the property gets deeded, like us doing a subject to deal, they can technically call the loan due. Now I'm here to tell you, that banks don't actually give the money for these properties, they service the contract. And when they're servicing millions and millions of loans, the only thing they care about is you got it, cash flow. Long as those checks are coming in and there's no issues with the property, it's not in arrears, it's not behind, then nine times out of 10, they are not gonna look on it. There is a chance in doing a subject to deal that the note can be called on the due on sale clause. Remember, it's not a law, it's part of the mortgage in which the, the original person that took out the mortgage agreed to those terms, thereby being enforceable by the banks. So the due on sale clause is real. I'm telling you, in my experience, there's a less than one, maybe a one and a half percent chance that you actually get a property called on a due on sale clause. And there's usually some sort of motivating factor. Um, the property's in arrears or there's something wrong with the property. So guys, if you make the payments on time, you do run the risk of a due on sale clause, but I don't think it's a big deal. I've never had one called on me. I've heard of a few, but worst case scenario, you could refinance the property, get soft money or get a hard money and cure the situation. Remember, a due on sale clause, they would have to give ample time to get the property sold and get that mortgage cashed out. So you still have options to do with it. The other risk is you got to understand is the debtor, the person that takes out that mortgage, is their name is still associated to the mortgage and the note, which means in the end, if someone were to stop making payments on that mortgage, that the debtor would ultimately be responsible. That's never going to shift. And that is a risk of doing a subject to from the seller standpoint. But think about this. They're doing a deal where nobody else will help them. Every realtor tells them they got to pay $20,000, $30,000 at the closing table and they're upside down on the properties. To me, this is a calculated risk a seller would take. People always say, why would they enter into a subject to? Listen, if you owe more than the property's worth and someone's willing to take over your mortgage payment and it saves your credit, it saves you from foreclosure and it saves you from like a lot of embarrassment, you can see why they would want to do it. So the main thing is when you do a 
subject to deal is to fully disclose everything to the seller. All parties should be in agreement. I'm taking over your payment. This is what I'm going to do. And if you have an agreement to cash it out on X amount of date, you've got to live up to that agreement. Or if you're taking over the original terms of the mortgage, make sure you get it paid full all the way to the end. And obviously if you sell it, that mortgage is going to pop up on a lien and it would get satisfied when you decided to sell it. Other thing you want to watch out for some pitfalls is when a client, meaning a seller is in any type of foreclosure situation, they enter into a loan modification. A lot of the loan modification alters the original mortgage. So if you're dealing with a client that has done a loan modification, make sure you get a copy of that paperwork because of a lot of the new loan mods have a personal um, residency guarantee in it, meaning it says you have to reside in the property for at least two years and agree to commit to this doing the loan mod. So if there's been a loan modification and they're guaranteeing personal residency, that could be a risk of the subject too, because you know you're taking over the property knowing the current owner is not going to be living there. So just make sure you read your paperwork. And if all else fails, make sure you review it with your real estate attorney. That way you keep yourself out of hot water. But really, other than that, there's not there's not a lot of big risks in doing a subject too. The main thing you have to understand is a subject to is the seller has to be 100, 110% on board because you are going to have to get assistance with paperwork and everything else that we do. So that leads us to the next big thing, which is basically taxes. And like, Rick, how does taxes work? Now, keep in mind when somebody, most of these houses we're talking about subject to are of a personal nature, meaning they're personal residents and they live there and they can deduct the mortgage interest, but they cannot take any type of depreciation on the property. It doesn't work that way on, on, on private residence. Now you are basically taking an equitable ownership in the property. As long as you're on record with it, I'm not going to tell you how to do that. You want to review that with a lawyer, but make sure your interests are representing the property that you transfer the, the deed into whatever authority you want to do it to. That is super important because then it becomes basically a rental property for you. And then you can take advantage of all the tax savings, the depreciation, the write-offs, all the expenses on it, and you can write it off through your LLC or whatever entity that you're doing on it. And it works really, really well. And that way I like, I, that's why I love to take over subject two is you got to make sure that your intent is on owning the property and therefore you get the fair taxable advantages of it. Now I know what you're saying. Well, what about the owner? Like, can they deduct the mortgage interest? The reality is if you take it over, you take, take deductions. You guys cannot share. Once again, I'm not a CPA. Check with your accountant for full disclosure on IRS terms on this, but you've got to take control of the property you are responsible for it. You record an equitable interest. You're allowed to take the deduction. So guys, it's really, really important to understand these concepts. Now I'm going to throw in a little twist on this. Okay. I'm just going to kind of bring it out there. A lot of people talk about land trusts when doing subject to deals. And I'm here to tell you when I started out doing my first creative financing deals, that was the only way I was taught was land trust. The reason you hear these word land trust there, the whole purpose of a land trust is to hide the identity of the tree true owner of the property. Okay. Now back in the day, it actually used to work really well. Land trusts are used like corporations like Disney and stuff like that. So they can put all the pieces together um, to a larger project without everyone knowing they're buying everything in town and it keeps them anonymous. And then they usually get the best price and they don't have to share what they're doing. Now, the purpose of a land trust in like a subject to deal is to disguise who the owner of the property is, almost make it seem like the current owner is still the owner and it winds up being sold as an asset protection vehicle. And I'm here to tell you, they really don't work as well today, especially for subject twos, because number one, first of all, a land trust is not a recordable document. So for you to sell that property or do anything, you're going to have to eventually present the land trust documents to the title company and an underwriter is going to review it. And then it's going to wind up becoming public knowledge anyways. Number two, most people do a land trust that they can get around the due on sale clause. I'm telling you, I've seen due on sale clause be called because the land trust, when when you switch it into a land trust, then you are basically changing the ownership of the property. Now, technically they're going to say, well, it's for asset protection purposes for this current client. The reality is you are manipulating it. So I don't have a problem with land trust. I don't use them because they don't fulfill the purpose anymore for subject twos. You're going to record you as the new owner on record, your LLC, or whatever it is. And honestly, you have to eventually sell that property. You're going to have to disclose it. And number three is once you go through that charade is you've already changed the deal to the property to, you know, ABC land trust. And that in itself would trigger the due on sale clause. And honestly, if they call,
call it, are you ready to get into a legal court battle because you're going to have to reveal your land trust documents? And honestly, it's an old school way of doing it. It still works in particular cases, but in this case, I would not use them when you do a subject two because you're better off just being transparent because you're trying to deal with your seller. And if you start hiding stuff, it can get like a little bit crazy. And honestly, if the due on sales out there, you might as well just go ahead and do it the right way. I don't think the land trust is going to save you. That reason I don't recommend doing it. And I think you're better off just being transparent. Now we've talked about the tax part. We talked about the land trust. The only other obstacle you have to watch out for is sometimes is the insurance policy. Now the insurance policy is it gets a little bit sticky because they're usually coincided with the mortgage. And if you don't have insurance on the property, the mortgage company can enforce coverage on you, which is very expensive. So you want to keep the policy up to date. Okay. And then what you need to be, what you have to do is added to the insurance policy as an additional named insured. And then usually on a lot of properties, we go one step further and get our own separate insurance policy. It depends on the property and what state you're in, but you've got to make sure you're covered, make sure the house is covered in the event of any type of fire or like wind damage, hurricanes, tornadoes, anything like that, floods. So make sure you're up to date on your insurance policy. And I would work your insurance carrier to understand what you're doing on a subject to deal because traditional insurance companies, they get a little bit squirrely about it and you've got to find the right people to help guide you through that. So understanding that is once you do that, you get the full tax benefits. And as I said, guys, remember wrapping this up, you have to have a hundred percent cooperation from your seller because the reality is a subject to deal means you're probably the best for them because nobody else can help them. The realtors can't help them. The lawyers can't help them. God knows the title can't, company can't help them out. So if you truly want to help people out and do subject to deals, now you know that they're legal. You know some of the pitfalls that come with it. You understand what a land trust is when people throw it out to you and you understand the tax advantages of doing subject to deals. And the really cool thing about subject to deals, guys, is you're never limited by them because you're not doing bank underwriting financing. So if you want to go out and do 20, 30, or 100 of them, you can absolutely do them. Just know what you're getting into it. You understand the do on sale clause. Guys, this isn't scary. Go help people that have no other way to sell their house. A subject to is perfect for anyone who has low equity or they're upside down on their property and they just want to get out from it. Go out and help a seller with the subject to. So guys, let me know in the comments if you're taking advantage of subject twos and do you think they're legal? And if not, tell me why. I would love to hear from you guys. Do me a favor, smash that like button, hit that subscribe button. This is Rick Ginn and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.